Hello everyone and welcome to the F45 Discovery Day. My name is Bianca and I am your host for today. So pleased that all of you could join us. Um, just looking through now, looks like we have a diverse group on us, um, some from all places around the world. So we're really excited to give you some insight on F45 and answer any lingering questions you might have about operating and owning your own F45 studio. Uh, so basically our goal for the session today is to provide you with as much information to make you feel as confident and comfortable as possible with moving forward in the next stages of your F45 franchise journey. Um, feel free to pop any questions you might have throughout the session in the chat box. We'll be uh, monitoring this the whole session. So add any queries in there um, and we'll do our best to get through these um, throughout the call. If we for some reason don't, um, we'll be in touch with you after the call. Uh, we have some awesome points to cover today um, about securing your own F45 franchise. Um, so again, if anything comes up during the call, pop it in the chat box. Chances are more often than not, your question might be someone else, something someone else might be thinking, or it might fire off another question or trigger something else. Um, that might be really beneficial for the group. So uh, feel free to pop it in the chat box. Uh, so us at F45, we could talk days about F45, um, but it's really important to get it from an owner's perspective. Um, you know, they've been through the challenges, they've had their wins, and they're currently um, functioning of extremely successful F45. So we thought it'd be awesome to get some F45 studios on our panel. Um, so we have three on our panel today, which um, operate in very different parts of the UK and Europe and have very different backgrounds. So there's definitely something everyone can relate to here. Um, so I'm just gonna fire off. First, we have Jane Roach from F45 Brighton Central here in the UK in the lovely seaside town of Brighton. Um, she opened in January, 2018. Jane, do you mind giving us a quick uh, rundown of your F45 experience so far? Yeah, thank you, Bianca. Hi, everyone. Um, so it's been an incredible journey from the moment that uh, I guess I signed up from the position that you guys are in now through to um, three and a bit years down the line. Um, it's the first year, obviously, once um, you get that franchise agreement signed, it's all around finding your location and finding the right place to set your studio up. I was very lucky that that all came together really quickly. Um, so there's obviously a lot of background work in a bit of building and getting everything right, ready for, for your opening. Um, and that is a journey that I think all of us as F45 franchisees will have different experiences of. Um, so we opened um, in January 2018. Uh, there was no, we were only the second stroke third F45 to open in the UK. So it was still, you know, very much a, a new brand, so to speak. Um, also in Brighton, it wasn't something that a lot of people had heard of or were familiar with. Um, we had lots of people who traveled through Australia um, who'd maybe been familiar uh, with F45 out there, but hadn't experienced it yet in the UK. So uh, do you want me to tell you a little bit about the pre-opening, Bianca, or what would you like me to do to talk about from that point? Um, that's fine for the moment. We might touch on that um, when we get to the questions, but um, I might introduce Dave, um, Dennis Galinsky from F45 Munich Obersendling, our very first studio in Germany. He opened in April 2020, which was actually during the pandemic. Um, De um, Dennis, do you mind giving us a quick rundown of your experience so far? Sure. Yeah, I can just agree with Jane. It's been an incredible, incredible journey, even though we had um, yeah, the entire COVID pandemic right in the last um, year and more. But F45 has done really an amazing job in providing us as owners of like material to do online classes. They put that together in just a few weeks to really be able to run sessions from home as well. I think that was a really big part to kind of keep our community in the beginning. Like we only were open last year for about five months and then we went into lockdown. So we actually did about online class for about six months. Um, but during that time, we um, were able to hold our community together and kind of make their days a little brighter uh, during those lockdown days where you couldn't really do much, which was, um, yeah, just incredible to see, right, to bring these people together, even though it was just virtually. And now everyone's back in the studio for about a month. We've been open for about a month again. Um, and now everyone was super happy to kind of get back in, actually meet each other in person. A lot of these have just made each other online. So it's, yeah, a cool, uh, very cool experience so far. And I'm looking forward to all the questions you guys have. 
Awesome. Thanks, um, Jane and Dennis. And last but not least on our panel of franchisees, we have um, George Cook from F45 Blackwall here in London, UK. Um, George opened in December 2019 and came into the franchise network as a sole owner. Joel, um, sorry, George, do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, so hi guys. So, um, so as Bianca said, so we opened in December 2019. Um, my background before um, being a, um, an owner of the studio was essentially I used to play professional rugby and a lot of my kind of teammates were from Australia and New Zealand, where obviously the brand's very uh, strong and well known. And I was just seeing pictures coming up on my Instagram feed of like wolf selfies and stuff like that with a sign. And I was just a bit nosy about what this was about. And when it first then came to London, I just started training like a member in one of the studios uh, that first popped up in central London and just super enjoyed the experience. And that's when the seed kind of got planted and it kind of took a little bit of time, but more for myself just to make sure like I was in the right position to, to think about kind of making that step forward. Um, and like I say, when I made that decision and started speaking with Mike, it was then kind of roughly like under a year running before we got our doors open. So we opened in E14, which is just outside kind of Canary Wharf um, in kind of East London. And hey, it's been it's a super challenging, but super rewarding experience. And like, I get to wear shorts every day to work. So I'm winning, right? <laughs> Epic. Um, thanks so much, guys. Um, so on our panel also, uh, we have F40, um, two F45 um, HQ staff. We have D, uh, Mike Dean, who's the head of European sales, and Nikki Powell, who is the European performance manager. They'll be able to chime in at any point during the session if any questions come up. Um, guys, do you mind giving us a bit of background on what you do at F45? Yeah, I'll, I'll do a quick hello. Uh, hello, everyone, whoever, hello, everyone, to who's joined the call today. Uh, and thanks for coming along. Um, a lot of you, unfortunately enough for you, have heard me drone on many a time before. Uh, and this call, I'm going to keep as quiet as possible. Um, I'm going to be fielding a lot of questions. So please, as Bianca said earlier, do use the chat box. And um, today's all about you getting as much information from the franchisees as possible. Um, I've been with the brand now for a little over three years. I've helped develop the UK market and, and now indeed the European one as well. As I said, looking at the list of uh, attendees that we've got on here today, I think I've pretty much spoken to all of you. So I'll keep it short and sweet, but please do keep those questions coming in the chat box as we move along. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. Hey, thanks, Bianca. Um, so guys, I'm Nikki and I'm the performance manager for the F45 UK, Europe, Middle East and Africa. I've been with the company for just around three years now, absolutely love it. Um, to summarise my role is to basically guide studios to be as successful as possible, all the way from pre-sale to mature trading. This can be done in a variety of ways, uh, like marketing, sales processes, product delivery and anything in between. Every step of the way, you'll have access to expertise, best practices to help you deliver the F45 product with complete confidence. I've helped a variety of franchisors from all different backgrounds to assist in creating a successful studio. So I'm totally here for you guys from the moment you sign the dotted line right up until till the very end. So uh, looking forward to hoping to, to work with you guys in the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so without further ado, further ado let's fire off these questions so Jane from F45 Brighton you're first up so a typical question that does come up um, before securing an F45 franchise is what was your pre-launch marketing strategy so when you opened um, before you opened how did you get your studio name out there yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I think this is obviously the, the the pinnacle of where you want to be. You don't want to open an open day without having really thought about this pre-launch strategy. Um, first of all, I attended the F45 um, global induction in um, America. And so that week just gave me the most inspiration, first of all, to think of ways in which that we could apply um, learnings from other studios and best practices from other studios and apply it in our own. Um, so you come away from your induction week at F45 feeling really prepared. So there was lots of things that we picked up. Um, first of all, we knew that we needed to start collecting um, names, email addresses, and we went along the route of giving out two week, two week trials for free. Um, we did this by creating, at the time three years ago, we had our own little um, CSV file that we created a web 
web page so we could talk to people about it and then we could put their details in save it and then we'd have a backlog of clients ready to start when we when we um, actually opened so one of the first things that we did is we found a local um, sports and franchise exhibition so this sports and franchise exhibition is outside it's all triathletes um, lots of different companies people showing different um, different fitness products and brands but there was lots of athletes also competing at the time so it was a two-day event so we just brought ourselves down we brought a rowing machine down we brought our f45 banners down we created some little competitions um, and we created um, within those competitions the opportunity to win three six 12-month memberships so by the end of the two days of the sports and fitness festival we'd sort of i think we created like over 500 different um uh, email addresses and names of potential clients. So that was in the September. We then sort of went along the route of um, getting involved with some local radio DJs. So we got some local radio DJs in. We used them um, just to talk about our pre-launch. We also offered them free membership, we offered them the chance to do, to do the challenges. Um, and that really helped just with more local exposure of the brands getting recognized. And then we did all the things that um, I guess the F45 induction recommends to do. So all local cafe owners, um, hairdressers, we did little raffles. We did um, as much as we could do to extend our local um, reach and influence. Um, and then as well as that, we ended up organizing lots of outdoor fitness training so we we partnered with a number of um big office blocks that had like rooftops that we were able to use so we ran weekly free fitness classes in a range of different places um and then we also had uh, i think i talked about that radio advertising as well so by the time we actually got we, we really kicked this off i think around sort of september 2017 and we knew that we were due to hopefully open in the january so we opened the start of january 2018 so sort of four months prior uh, we ended up with something around 1200 people signed up to do a two-week trial so we ended up having to roll we were so successful to start with which was it was it, in one way it was quite surprising but also it was awesome so we had to actually section our two-week trialers into like two-week blocks so that people could book from the first two weeks and we had like say um 250 300 people could book there and we did that all the way through for the first um sort of eight weeks of us being open so the reason that was obviously incredible is that first of all on the first day of opening we had full classes which was amazing um, so there's an amazing buzz in the studio um, and then it was just that sales process had to naturally kick in from there we obviously ran a launch day as well and had like lots of like prizes and things like that but from the very outset it meant that we had a really buzzy high energy studio it wasn't like there was three people in um, I think a really good thing to think about as well with the pre-launch strategy and, and that seed was planted from the induction was don't think about given those two weeks being free as in like oh you're giving something away it's just marketing um and i think once you get your your head around that it's like well actually especially when you first open it's actually a really good way to engage with people show them the energy in your studio show them what it is and the two-week period gives them long enough time to be able to realize actually i'm quite addicted to this and i really like it so it makes that initial sales flow pro process a lot easier when you first start amazing and that really does attest to your success today, I'd say. So you, that's amazing. Does anyone have anything um, to add about their pre-open marketing strategy to that? All right. The only thing that we did, and I'm sure the other guys did the same, was as, you, as you're leading to that opening, um, how you're actually kind of engaging with your kind of prospects as such. Um, and... What I was surprised with was 90% of our sales is probably done through WhatsApp. Um, so, and these were pre-sales before, yes, they may have come to some of our boot camps, but before they've actually put foot in the door, um, it was all around kind of engaging with people through a kind of, again, it just felt like it was the most responsive way to get kind of messages out of people. Um, so when you're collecting people's data, make sure you've got their mobile number. Um, and like I say, you can let them know, you can remind them, you can set little groups up, but sending the messages around the boot camps that you're running and also drip feeding that you're going to release X amount of, um, X amount of um, tier one um, foundation memberships. Um, then they start building that excitement that they want to be one of those that gets the first 25 best offer and things like that and the welcome pack and things like that. Um, and what I was finding is if you're trying to phone or email, we were getting just almost no response or I'm busy. Whereas you drop a message, they would comply when they want. And it also suddenly breaks down this relationship piece where you are almost becoming a bit of a friend. You're in the same 
form of communication as their mates are. Um, and that's been really successful for us. As painful as WhatsApp can be, it's been really useful sales tool for us. So we would definitely recommend to people to think about how you use that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That's really good tips. Um, so staying on the pre-open status, um, Dennis from F45 Munich over Sendling, we're just going to pass this over to you. So your studio is located in Munich in Germany. How did you pick your studio location when you were looking for it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, obviously, in a new market, um, it's wide open. You don't have to kind of stay in your territory. You can kind of go wherever you find the best location because like, we're the first one in Germany. So um, we can kind of pick wherever we like basically to be, right? It might be different in London now. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a good question. So what we did is we contacted um, multiple real estate agents to kind of help us with the search also kind of keep our like eye open online on all kinds of different sites, right? To kind of see just what's out there um, because there's all these, there's certain requirements, I guess, that you need to meet for F45 to open a studio. Right? So you have to meet those like three meter ceiling heights and all those things. So at least in Germany, it was actually quite difficult to find a location um, because there's, there wasn't much out there pre-COVID, right? And now post-COVID, it might be all different. It might be much, much easier because there might be some businesses going out of business, right? Like restaurants, um, whatever it is. But um, pre-COVID, it was kind of challenging actually um, to find a place. Um, but once we did, um, that was obviously a great experience. And, and how we picked our location was mostly based on, we, we knew we wanted to be in Munich, obviously, right? And then we kind of looked at the, the target audience where like the, the target audience for 45 is generally like 25 to let's say 45 and maybe a little bit more female than male. Um, so we kind of looked at Munich as a city and, and looked at where the younger audience would be, um, where they live, right? And try to also, also consider uh, office buildings because um, when we could have lunch classes during that time and there's like a lot of offices next to there or even partner with corporations, that could be a big revenue driver to maybe them booking um, exclusive classes with us so like that was also definitely a major factor in considering where we wanted to be in Munich um, and then taking all these factors in consideration and obviously um, finding the right location also based on on price and rent costs right um, then you kind of go from there and do a lot of viewings um, but those are the factors that we kind of considered so there's 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 a lot of factors and there might be other more important things for for new owners right but those are were the ones for uh, the kind of mattered for us and I think they actually worked out pretty well because I mean now we're about let's say for in-studio class about six months in um, and in a brand new market so we basically right where Jane was maybe three years ago when like you guys were um, one of the first in the UK so we're still trying to build that brand awareness doing all these things for pre-opening or basically like early stage opening marketing to kind of collaborate with businesses offices um, so those are the things we were trying to do to find a location yeah Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to jump over to George Cook from F45 Blackpool here in London and kind of sticking to the studio location um, status. What, what's the most important things you looked for when you were um, looking in for real estate? Um, I think one thing that we were looking for was like the mix of residential and kind of commercial around. And at the time, pre-COVID, we were looking for a pretty much straight split of 50-50. It felt like that felt about right. Um, again, given the world that we now live in, I think that would have maybe shifted a little bit more towards people working where they live as opposed to where they work. Um, I think there's probably a bit of a shift of people working three days a week, so therefore they'd like to train nearer where they live. So we're lucky in the fact that where we ended up landing, um, we have got a nice split and it is quite residential as well. But originally, the location-wise, we were looking for that split. When we were looking round sites, as everyone knows that's kind of started playing around with their numbers, one of the biggest costs, the biggest cost you're going to have is your fit-out. And it can range from a paint job to something from Shell and Core where you're building all the walls and putting the floor in. And it was just weighing up that decision of getting the location right, but not having too much of a cost as well. And there is a fine balance between, they have to be nice, don't get me wrong. So there's a fine balance between them being nice and that boutique feel and almost, but you can also spend too much on your fit out and be a bit wasted. And it's going to be one of your biggest costs. So that was one of the biggest things that we were constantly playing with. And we had quotes on our fit out. We went from Shell and Core, so there's a lot of work to be done. There was a difference in about 70 to 100 grand from different fit out teams. So again, don't get me wrong. 
members would enjoy a gold tap, but they don't need them. But there is also that kind of balance between a CrossFit gym where it's very dusty, often quite dark, that it needs to be more of a premium product than that in terms of the towels you're using and things like that. So that whole balance is, 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 is carefully done. And it's something that you need to kind of really kind of consider because you want to be keeping your costs low, but really kind of push for as much um, kind of premium feel as possible. And um, that was definitely one thing. The other thing as well, when you are looking at your locations, the biggest thing, and you'll have done it all with your cash flow models, is trying to engage and get this rent-free period because that is a game changer. Um, it just takes pressure off. And I think the, the tenant is now king as opposed to when we were looking at spaces, the landlord was, we were in the destiny of the landlord and we almost had no space to negotiate. Whereas I think if you're looking at engaging in conversation with landlords now, you should be really pushing hard on good rent-free periods and then be as creative as you can with that. So if let's say they were generous and gave you 10 months rent free or 12 months rent free try and break it if you can where maybe you get six months rent free and then the remaining six months split into 12 months half rent and things like that as much pay as you can push away from when you're opening it just takes your pressure off you and it allows you to make the right decisions as opposed to being worried about how many members you're getting in you can worry about services and deliver a really good product so again if you can have these conversations with landlords it makes a huge difference so keep your costs to a level that are manageable. Don't spend an extra hundred grand on your fit out because you want uh, something a bit special in the changing rooms. So manage that balance and then work really hard to get a good deal with your landlord. Um, and I think there will be some great deals to be had at the moment. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, so a super common question that we get all the time is about staffing. Um, Jane, how did you get your the right trainers on board um, when you started your studio? Um, yeah, so again, very, very important because this is the heartbeat of the studio. Um, so I'm not sure about Dennis and George, I presume you're both owner and trainers in your studios. Um, but I, from the outside, as have obviously owned the studio, but I've also worked from the outside as a trainer myself. Um, so my own background was that I actually only retrained as a personal trainer five years ago. So, um, and obviously I opened F45 three years ago. So at that time I was still fresh to um, to be in an F40, to be in, to be in a personal trainer as well as an F45 trainer. So uh, to start with, I actually made some amazing contacts locally with people that I knew. Um, so I already am in the back of my head when we, we were in the process, knew there's a couple of people I've met who had met, I guess, first of all, in training, but then who became friends that I really wanted to bring on board. Um, one great little tip that I had was just to go incognito. Um, not very many people uh, like knew or not necessarily knew of me, but in Brighton, I just went to a load of different classes, lots of different gyms, lots of different studios, went and tried out the classes, um, just seeing their actual trainers in action without them knowing that I was coming to see whether they're this type of person that I'd like to approach. And then I ended up with a bit of a short list of about six, seven people that I really liked that I'd been to different various classes with. And then we put um, obviously um, an advertisement out closer to the time, I think it was around um, like late October, November time. So just two months prior to open to say that we were opening and to, to invite um, responses from people. And then from there, um, went through a whole host of different. So I did a telephone interview, a face-to-face -face interview, and then we ran an audition day. And at that stage, because I was personal training quite a few people myself, I brought into the studio lots of my clients that I was PT in. Um, and we asked the trainers, uh, we, we asked them to come down to the studio. We asked them to coach basically a mini pod of uh, cardio-based exercises and a mini pod of strength-based exercises so we could just see their strengths and weaknesses in or strengths hopefully in um in i guess their energy and how they performed and also in their coaching cues and a lot of it i think with um the f45 trainers is that for that 45 minutes of people's day that they're choosing to spend with you it's that they should leave the studio feeling like they have had the best 45 minutes of their day so it's, there's really like a huge energy connection and I think for me because I you know spend a lot of time in the studio so I'm there full full plus full time hours is that I've always had in my head is this the type of person I would want to spend time with and as well as being as a good trainer and so we've been really selective about who we've actually brought on board in our training team and we've got an amazing training team now we've got nine trainers who have become like super close friends our retention rate's amazing I think London may be different but in Brighton um there's not as much uh, transient uh, movement. So we've retained the trainers that we've had. They genuinely love being there. We look after them really well. Um, but I think, you know, just doing that homework to start with of like really testing 
and, and making it almost uncomfortable for yourself that don't be afraid to say you know actually I'm going to bring them back in and get them to to do it again just to get a feel of is this the, exactly the right person that I want part of my team and then that cohesiveness as a team and we've worked more on that as well like I've been over three years now obviously but who works better together who helps to bring each other up because not everyone even though they're they're really good trainers sometimes people aren't quite you know uh, that as cohesive together so now I know who works brilliantly together who's like they have a laugh they get the trainers they get their members energized um and um yeah it, it, and then it feels like a great place to be so people walk in they feel that energy and they feel um that, I guess the happiness and the joy of the other trainers that are that are there with them and that's so important for the members Awesome. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, so Dennis from F45 Munich over Sendling, um, cracking a new market and bringing F45 to a whole new country is super exciting. Um, so we're just wondering, how did you build up um, your membership base at the start? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the community is like the key, one of the key factors of the F45 brand, right? And basically keeping your current members for them to stay longer, um, for them to kind of become friends, um, being like, a, yeah, like Jane said, the best 45 minutes of their day, right? Um, so basically building that community and that brand is very important. So there's um, a few things we do, but last summer um, we did like events at um, like certain restaurants or bars or even at the park to just play some kind of like volleyball or sports, right? Just to basically offer almost like a weekly or bi-weekly event so people can come together also outside the studio to um, make friends, to basically people that just moved to Munich, for example, they just come, they feel welcome, they basically make their friends now in the studio and that makes it even harder for them to leave. So that you remember retention and, and basically growing that community is really um, getting much more stronger if you have that community factor. Um, and also that the trainer team also is very important, right? Uh, like Jane said, the, their personality, I would say, is almost more important than actually how good they are as fitness trainers, I would say, um, because that personality makes a huge difference also in that community aspect there. Because then when the trainer bring that energy, they bring that welcoming vibe, right? Like it's not, you have to be the fittest athlete in the room. It's just like the, that welcoming vibe that's in the, the atmosphere, that's in the studio, that also helps you grow the community. And, and doing certain events like this weekend on Saturday, we're doing a Euro Cup themed workout, right? Because the Euro Cup's going on. Everyone's like really into it, watching it at bars and restaurants every night. Um, so that's what we're doing to kind of also bring the, together the community and then have some snacks or some like uh, healthy snacks, drinks outside the, or Hollywood sessions on Saturdays to kind of get people talking after the uh, event, talking to our trainers, talking to each other. So really just like doing little things here and there. So people interact more with each other um, and not just inside, like the when, when we have the sessions, but also like after um, and really just continuing and on and on. And that helps again also with like referrals. Like we get a lot of our members from actually member referrals. So like when they're in the studio, they're bringing their friend for a free, free seven day trial. So we're doing a seven day trial, not two week. Um, and then that kind of grows from there, right? To so just have these events, or you can partner with local companies. Like we have a partnership with Lululemon. So we're gonna do a workout of them this summer to, um, because they usually have this yoga kind of or a workout room usually in most of their stores. So we're gonna do an F45 workout at the Lululemon store this summer. And that also increases our brand awareness, but also brings like the Lululemon community to our community kind of. So you can do a lot of things to grow that community, but those are the things we were doing and that has really helped us um, from the beginning. I've just got a, a question come in there, Dennis, uh, which is probably more directed to you, but it could actually go for the whole group. Um, when launching, uh, did your trainers know about F45 previously? Had they had experience with F45 or, or did you have to train them before they started training? Good point. Yeah, good point. A new market, it's very hard and very challenging to find any trainer with F45 experience. I mean, I think two of my trainers out of the six, they knew F45 before we hired them, but the rest did not, right? So we had to hire them. We had to actually send um, our, our studio manager to Amsterdam to kind of get onboarded there, to get an experience, like take some sessions. But that's something for sure that's challenging, right? In a new market there, the closest studios are like three, four hour driving distance away. You can't just like tell all your trainers, hey, go there really quick for a session a few times this week, right? 
So no, they did not know about FOSF. So I kind of had to um, bring in my experience from like training in the US a lot because that's where I lived for six years um, to kind of help them know more about the brand and really take it on board. And then there's also the F45 Academy, which is like an online learning course basically to get all the trainers on board to kind of teach them about all the F45s do's and don'ts, right? So that's the great start, but then obviously you have to do your own thing in the studio as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so in terms of growth and development and evolution of your studio, I'm gonna hit this one at George Cook from F45 Blackwall. What do you feel is a um, realistic growth rate for your studio? Um, so it, it, it will obviously change depending on what part of the journey you are in terms of whether or not you've just opened or reopened after a lockdown, or if you're kind of well into like a year one of being open and kind of running through. But essentially our journey was we targeted to have 50 foundation memberships join the gym as the doors were open. So the offer for them was they basically almost got the first week for free and then their membership was going to start rolling month to month. And they also were given some kind of free boot camps as we were leading up to opening. So that was our target. We were ahead of that. So we got to, we were about 75 signed up members um, when we opened and then we had a kind of plan which was we turned on free trials so there's a fine balance between you want the the workouts to be nice and busy because obviously that's what the atmosphere is all about but at the same time you don't want to grow too quickly businesses that will grow too quickly come up more trouble than businesses that do it properly so I would say a big bit of advice is be really close to how classes feel, be in the studio. So when you know if it's feeling a bit quiet, so you can slowly build your membership at a point that works with whatever cash flow models and things like that you've got in place. But our plan was to open with 50, we opened with 75, and then it was to grow steadily at 25. So 25 members a month. And we were exceeding that for the first kind of three or four months at about 35. So that was kind of what we were finding ourselves doing. In London, there is a, there's a feel that there's a lot of people renting where they live. Therefore, there's a lot of change in terms of they move around a little bit more than maybe other places. And also we've been in and out of lockdown. So there's been lots of circumstances to change it. So it's almost like I couldn't give, like my model was just like this. Whereas it, it's been, obviously we've gone into lockdown and then some months we, we've reopened and we broke up like new members of 55 in one particular month. So it's very hard to give that number, but I know that everyone on this call likes the reassurance that they can like feel this cash flow coming through. If you've got 12 months of open ahead of us, which hopefully the world is reopening and that's what we're going to have, I would always play, find out what your number needs to be and make sure that it's a realistic number. So if you can live and survive your studio on growing at 25, you will achieve that if you go through the process that you need to. We were always like, we've always done a head of plan, which is obviously always a nice place to be when we're talking to our banks and loans saying we're gaining an extra 15 members a month ahead of plan and things like that. So hopefully that helps. Our best months we've signed, like I say, over a, a lot more than our target of 25, but on an average of a steady month, it's a kind of 35 a month that we're growing at. We obviously have a drop off in London um, and it's been very inconsistent on that because we've been open and closed in such short periods. So I wouldn't say that's almost a relevant number to share, um, but it's more because people have moved. The main thing that we look at in our studio is why have people left? And I can sit here now confidently say no one has left to, to move to competition. They've all moved through circumstances around jobs and leaving home, which is at the end of the day, you can only control what you can control. But then what I would say about membership, you can turn on and off the free trials if you need to. For example, if you offer free trials to your mailing list, you're going to get lots of clicks and lots of people come through the gym. And that's might be what you want to create is a bit of energy. Our conversion on trial lists was obviously a lot lower on free trials versus paid trials. I think if I went again, again, I would try and be as confident as possible just to do paid trials because my, we went 18 paid trials in a row where they converted. We were trying to hit 20 in a row. So 18 of the first people that came through, they were buying a membership, which is obviously mega. On a free trial, you know when they come through, they book in for seven days in a row and you never see them again and they don't answer, in, answer any of your WhatsApps, however funny that my memes might be to them. But... What, what we did find is what it was doing at the time is it was filling classes, which is also very important for the vibe. And when you're in a room of a new studio, no one really knows who's paying and who's not. So you can create quite a big buzz through a free room. And at the end of a Hollywood, if you say you've got five foundation members left, 
left, you're going to be stood outside selling them. You will naturally get a bit of a buying kind of need as well. So play with it and just be as close to those numbers as possible. Since we've gone through the reopenings, we've only ever done paid trials and our conversion ratio, like I say, at one point we were tracking at 100%, which is nuts, but they are literally over 50% of every paid trial at the moment is converted. And you go through, you go through waves, like just trust the processes like you tell your members with the gains that they're trying to achieve in the gym trust the process some weeks i'm like oh, we need to get some sticking and then all of a sudden we get five or six off the bounce we've had people on one day of their 14 week trial 14 day trial ask to buy the membership and i'm like make it harder for me like i'm like that's my job here they made me work for it and literally they're signing up already in in one session so it's everyone's a bit different but like i say the comfort that you guys want for when you can sleep at night, when you're working out all your numbers is plan, make it work on 25 to 35 and then you'll, you'll be good to go. Just I'll also quick. say just on that as well, guys. So you've got now five 45 day challenges a year and I'm sure the guys will agree with me that that's a, a really good time to, to drive sales. It's one of our best acquisition tools that we have, really great for marketing. So the 45 day challenge, five times a year, I think we plan our whole year, guys, don't we, around the challenge. Um, each time one happens, we're ready to market the next. And it's just a really epic acquisition tool, team. Thank you. Just a quick question that came in uh, on your uh, packs there, George. Did you do a percentage discount for your paid trial or was it just a, a set amount that stayed constant from the get-go? So the paid trial. So we did two weeks for 39 quid. Um, and sometimes if, if I'm, so the free trial, which is seven days free trying training, what we sell now is two weeks for 39 pounds. The big sale, it just works every time is when they're thinking about it, I say to them, if you sign up, I'll refund you your 39 quid. So when they're like in day 10 of the 14 and, and you go through a bit of a prospecting journey with that person. So when they come in, don't sell to them, just let them enjoy the experience halfway through, tell them it's been great having them in the studio. I hope they're enjoying it. And then on around day 10, that's when I kind of go into sales mode. I'll make sure I'm around the studio when they're in. And then I'll say, are you thinking about joining? Make sure that you unpack all the stuff that they do, body scans, the truck, everything, give them everything. And then say, listen, if you join today, we'll give you a 39 quid back. And that just seems that they then work out. They've almost had six weeks training for quite a discounted amount. And then you just got to back yourself that they're going to want to stay forever. So I don't think that might answer the question, but basically it's 39 quid for two weeks. Does that answer what the question was? It was a complicated question, right? It was, it was an awesome answer. I'll give you that. But yeah, you know, that'll be good for now. Um, they were just trying to work out what percentage your trial was comparatively to your full price. So what's your rolling rate normally? Ah, cool. Okay, so, so um, we were selling foundation tier one at we sold 25 at 165 pounds we then bumped it quite quickly once we sold them we sold them pre-open to 185 and we sold another uh 25 at that and then we went to 199 so the trial pay trial at 39 quid don't get me wrong it's almost nothing but it gives you that skin in the game that they're still 39 quid that's still a membership for a month in a local pure gym for example so they're still quite serious uh but it's not the, it's not a percentage split of a month Awesome. Better answer? Much better. Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Epic. Thanks, guys. Um, so, Jane from Brighton, back to you. Um, a super obvious but helpful question for anyone that might be on this call. What advice would you give to anyone that's thinking about op um, opening their own F45 studio? Um, I think George covered a good bit of it there as well. As, as much as it is about um, running uh, an amazing uh, atmospheric fitness studio is that you have to remember that to be prepared, be prepared for sales, it's such a huge part of the job. Um, so I think to get in that mindset is that yes, you are running incredible fitness classes and you are a boutique gym, but the, you have to work, to, you have to hustle to get those members in. And it, a lot of the time, as George alluded to as well, sometimes it doesn't feel like a hustle because what you're doing is you're doing such a good job with your actual um, fitness sides that and the trainers are epic, the classes are epic, that the sale comes in really easily. That, um, you know, as George said, people are coming on day one going, right, what do I do to sign up? But at other times is that, you know, you've got to make sure that you keep on top of who the people are that are coming into the studio, what stage in the process they're at, We've stuck with the two weeks um, in Brighton. We've just found that 
it really gives people that opportunity. We follow them throughout the first week of their of their sales um, process, and and um, as you guys said, just let them enjoy the journey. Make sure that the trainers know that they're new in the classes. To follow up with them, how are they getting on? Are they coming in tomorrow? Have they thought about the weights class? Have they thought about doing a Hollywood? Just really engaging with them so that they feel part of the core community. And then, in as we move into that second week of the trial, then we put just making sure that we're you know showing them what the options are. Um, I'm not sure what the other studios do, but in our studio we have a few options you can sign up on a monthly rolling contract or you can sign up with various different three months six months 12 month contracts um, and class passes so we also do an offer as well that if they sign up before the end of their trial period they'll get 50 percent off their first month's training if they sign up to a six month or 12 month contract and for us what's worked really well is that the vast majority of our members are in six month and 12 month contracts um, so it really ties people into the business for that period of time um, and also i guess then then really do become part and parcel of the family. So um, I guess tip one about being prepared, one, be, pre be prepared. Um, I I'm not sure if you guys on the call are gonna be um, just owners or you're gonna be um, owners and also operators. Um, you know, uh, we're year three in, um, we've put the, gra I've put the graphs in in that three year period, but it's been joy to do that. Um, so I think just, you know, really get on board, make sure you've got your pre-marketing strategy right, speak to as many other F45 studios as you can. I was lucky that um, some of the guys in, in London, Tottenham got Road had opened before me and they very kindly shared, um, I think about three or four days that let me just come up and really um, immerse myself in what it actually was on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but also just enjoy it. I think if you love what F45 is, and for me, I mean, I found out by F45 on Instagram, I was running my own little boot camps and kept seeing F45 just popping up and I realized it was a franchise. It just really spoke to me that this is exactly how I feel fitness should be. It, it, it felt like a really natural um, like partnership in a way. So if you love it, that's going to show in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's going to show with your members and it's going to make your studio a success. Um, there's, you know, the one thing that I've always had really strongly from the outset was a vision of what I wanted my studio to be like, what I wanted the training team to be like, um, how I wanted to be inclusive with our members and what how I wanted to felt. And, or to feel and you might know exactly all those things but if you can get what it should feel like and you everything that you do aligns with that for what you're going to do for your training team what you're going to do for your members then you know you're going to really enjoy the journey and I think that's probably the biggest bit is that it is a really enjoyable journey and like everything there's obviously little bumps in the road that we have to deal with I mean particularly last year we just hit our highest sales month ever in March and we were like woohoo we are rolling and then you know you think anything in your head you're like oh sure what could possibly go wrong but um you know you've got the support of an amazing global network it is does feel like a, a global family so there's always first of all someone to ask but also I think what the last year has shown from F45 is that you know F45 are going to support us as much as possible that, as they, they couldn't have done any more to support us in that period um, when you know no one's ever experienced a pandemic or anything like that before but we are a big family and and you know the support network is there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, Dennis uh, from Germany, uh, we've got a question through, how did you establish um, a viable price for your market since you were the first one to um, set up in Germany? Yeah, that's a good point. So the first thing I did is I looked at the other um, F45s outside the UK, because I think the UK is a little bit different price-wise, price structure-wise, price structure income level-wise compared to some of the European countries. So I, I compared myself as Germany more like other let's say equal income levels like Austria, I would say similar, uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands are similar, right? France is probably similar, but Italy, Spain, maybe Eastern Europe might be a little bit different price wise. So I looked at those countries first that I thought might be similar uh, income level wise. Looked at their 45 studios, looked at what they're charging and kind of that was my first baseline on what the price should be for us here in Germany, right? To kind of make it around the same, be not, not be like a low level price gem. So we decided on for a three month contract about 180 euro a month. Um, so yeah, that's probably a little lower than what you guys charge in the UK. Um, and then I also looked at the gyms here in Munich directly. Um, there's not that many actually, because uh, the German market is still fairly new to boutique studios. So there's only like a few spinning studios, biking, bicycle studios um, that are charging that but they were all doing more like a pay by like the class kind of pricing or even like a 10 class class 
So it's a little bit challenging and difficult to compare that as well. And there was one other like hit kind of style studio in Munich and they were charging around 190 or something like that. And they seem to be very successful. I went there a few times myself. So that's kind of, those were the factors that I took into consideration when, when coming up that price, right? Especially if there's not much to compare to, you kind of have to just set the price, see how it goes, start up those foundation memberships, get them in, fill your classes up, right? Or free trials and then go from there. Um, and then our strategy right now is not really to um, have many like sales, let's say, right? We're doing like a, basically full price memberships, but if they sign up in their seven day trial, then they get 50 euros off their first month to kind of put a little bit of pressure on them, to, let's say to, to sign up a membership during the trial. So that's what we're doing uh, for the sales process, uh, price structure wise. Um, but yeah, to, to determine the price, that's what we did. Basically looked at the other F45s. That was, I would say the biggest factor, especially the Amsterdam studio, because um, they've been open for about two or three years even, I think. So they're kind of a good, um, for us at least a good example to compare to. Um, then we went from there, yeah. Epic. Um, and I've got one here for George uh, from F45 Blackwall. We love hearing about, you know, people's wins, but sometimes we even like hearing more about people's challenges because essentially this is how we grow, develop as um, a business and a business owner. If you were talking to your future self before you started, um, is there something that you do differently um, from the start? Get a work phone. <laughs> Genuinely, that is a tip. Get a work phone uh, because I was that guy just sending WhatsApps off my personal and now it's just it's a nightmare. So um, definitely from day one, have a kind of sales phone and, and, and outline your sales process. I was pretty strict with how I saw that going. And obviously you've got to change the climate and how you, uh, and how you approach people. But um, like I say, set that up, have that in order. That's definitely one. I think... Another one, and I know we've mentioned it a lot about your team in terms of your training team, but it is so important. At the end of the day, walk into an empty studio. It may look lovely and white and painted, but there's not much to it. The second you put the coaches in there, it becomes a proper F45 training studio and it really comes to life. So I made some errors probably with who I, who I picked in my coaching team in the initial first days, whereas now where I sit is completely different. We have a training team of 10 and they are incredible. So I would take time on that. Don't rush that. Um, use the likes of Nikki. Nikki helped me with all of my best recruits. So please use Nikki. Um, she's seen so many studios. Um, what I would say about recruitment is on paper, it is the easiest job out there to be a F45 coach. The, the programming's done for you. You turn up, you wear kit and you coach. The difference between doing that and being a good F45 coach is world's difference. You know, the difference between a good one is it's not easy. You're coaching people individually. You're building rapport. You're building relationships. You're building trust. You're coaching people at stations that you're aggression or progressing. It's a very challenging role. So you need the best in the, in the area. And we are proud to say like in our little space, in our little area, we have the best coaches now. Whereas you can't bluff it. You can't have people that don't know what they're doing. So again, really take your time on picking the team that you're going to surround you because you can't as an owner, as much as I like to think I could have been, you can't be there all the time. So you have to trust the people that you've got in the studio when you're not there and know their roles and get them to know their roles. They are there to coach and, and that experience. You don't want them to think they're suddenly the salesperson. And for me, I've always had the responsibility of the sales side. That's allowed me to sleep at night, knowing that I'm kind of responsible for how the studio will perform from that side. Let them know when the members through the door, they are there to be coached. They're, there's coach and guide members through. The last thing you want is coaches kind of trying to float to the top and show them they can be head of sales because it's just not how you want things to be felt, felt in the studio. They're there to train and enjoy their experience. And then you can live and buy by that. And it, it was we were always fixed with that. It was more we had a few recruits that I just weren't happy with in terms of how they were performing and they were coasting through the second you see that you've got to try and work work them out um the other one i would say in terms of it wasn't necessarily errors now but if you're going into it as i mentioned it be be confident with the conversations that you're having with your landlords it is a huge difference um in terms of getting this rent free period into, into your deal um and I was at a stage where I would have probably found a location and just convinced myself it was the right one. You need to step back, speak to friends and say, do you think it will work here? Because you're so desperate to get operational, you may make a wrong decision. 
Whereas if you take your time, you know, if you get the location right, this works. So I would say just take your time in that. Again, it wasn't an error necessarily I made, but I almost could have fallen into that trap just because I wanted to get operational so quickly. Um, and I would have probably been in a more difficult position as a result of it. So again, take your time, but really work hard to get that training team around you and enjoy getting to know them, have training days, get them in the studio. Don't be amazed by their F45 experience. You want to pick the right people. I reckon of my 10, one of them has had F45 experience and the other nine there, and he's incredible, don't get me wrong, but the other nine are as incredible because they're good coaches and they're good with people. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's definitely kind of the, 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 the areas, but the main one was like, Timmy, I've got a wife and she hated me on my WhatsApp, so uh, get a work phone. <laughs> <laughs> Great top tip there, George. I've just um, had another question come in, and this is actually arguably open to, to, to any three of you, but George, if you want to take this while you're talking at the moment. Um, in terms of competition, are you looking for a market that has competition or that does not have competition? Yeah, have competition. That's what we live for, right? It shows that people are interested. If there's a barriers around the corner, it means someone else has thought it's a good idea to have one. Like, it depends in terms of your location, but we're, in, we're right next to Canary Wharf. In Canary Wharf, there's a gym called Third Space. If any of you have never been there, go there. It's an incredible facility. It's probably the best training facility in the world, right? And they are two miles away from where we are. But we know what they do and they do things great. They've got great facilities, but we also know what we do really, really well. So I, I don't sell against them. If someone says, oh, I'm a member of Third Space, I'm like, cool, we do things slightly differently, but what an amazing facility. And then just show them the way that you do things. If they are paying for a Third Space membership plus a PT once a week, they're probably spending the best part of a thousand pounds a month on their training. We're offering something at 200 quid and they're going to get a very similar experience. And if not, better from a coaching point of view. So just kind of be confident around what you can sell. We've got barriers. We've got everything on our doorstep. There's a lot of people out there and to be a successful storage studio, you probably need, well, 200, 220 members, let's say. Like there's a lot of people around there. And for us, like I say, it felt quite ballsy putting ourselves here. But if you go somewhere where there's no competition, there's probably a reason for that. Maybe there's just not the, the, the type of people that want to train in, the, in your studio. So, and back yourself, know the competition. Like, I know the values of places like Barry's, CrossFit, all these gyms. Like, be, as a trainer or tra like an athlete, I enjoy training in them. But I also know what we're really, really good at. So when a member comes through the door, I kind or a potential member, I kind of know what we're going to be able to offer that they've not had in any of these facilities. Um, and be confident with that. And, and don't. And one thing we've done from a sales point of view is we would never downplay other competition. Like have a bit of fun with it. But if they come in and say, oh, "I'm a member of Barry's, I'm interested," just be like, "Oh, Wicked Barry's is cool. One of my coaches does a bit of training there. It's really cool." Right? Let's show. Like this is what we do. The second you kind of say, "Oh, that's bloody shite. This will be better," they're just like, "Hang on a minute. You're a, you're a dodgy sales carman," which I feel like I am a bit. But just don't play that. Just. Play into your strengths, know what you guys do really well and like enjoy the competition. It keeps you on your toes. Every time we've reopened, we've had to reopen better because otherwise competition's moved ahead of us. So again, you can't just sit through it. You've got to always think of ways to make sure that the service you're adding, your one-to-ones, whatever it may be, is a better experience than it was a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. Um, and just back yourself. Like, it, it will come good. If I could just add on that as well, thanks, George, that we're not competitors with one another either. Um, so when you come into the network, we have divisions, we work really hard with price alignment. Um, the stronger your neighboring studio is, the stronger you guys are, the stronger your neighboring studio is on brand, the stronger you guys will be as a brand as well. So it's something we really do work hard on in, uh, in putting out there from the start. Thank you. Epic. I would um, just, I'm sorry, Bianca, just to jump on what Nikki said, it's a really good point because we have benefited off the back of other good studios. When a, a member moves here and they say, let's say they used to live in central London, they moved around this area and they're a member of F45, let's just say Soho. Like for us, that's amazing. They've had a great experience in F45 and then they come and join our gym. And we know that we've had members that have moved to other places and they're saying, oh, I'm going to join the gym. So it does really complement itself. And by being a good studio, you're also just helping brand awareness. When someone puts in the local studio to them, it might be because of the result of a friend that trains in your studio and they recommend it to a friend that lives in Brighton and then they go and train there. Like that happens all the time. And the amount of times I'm sending messages to other owners saying, one of my members has just moved in near you and they're going to be on a trial and they're great and you're going to want to join, they want to join. Like that happens all the time. And, and like I say, from a, that's the difference between being part of something a lot bigger than just yourself on your own over in the gym. 
and maybe on that as well, like even for us in Germany, there's no other studios yet, right? But we even had probably about 30 members or so that knew F45 that went to classes all around the world, like mostly Australia and London, obviously. And yeah, they came to our city because they knew the brand essentially. And I think that's also very powerful, even in new markets, right? Like Germany or probably all these other European countries, there's not very many studios. I mean, that's, that's really, really cool to see. They basically know the brand, they know kind of the, what the workout looks like, and those are like much easier sales than when you have someone in the studio that doesn't even know what F45 is, right? Awesome. Thank you so much. We've had some awesome questions through and um, your answers have been super, super helpful. I'm just going to pass this over um, to Mike Dean from Sales, who's going to outlay the next steps in moving forward with your F45 um, opportunity. Yeah, first and foremost, thank you for the panel today. Some awesome little bit of nuggets of information there. Um, some, some really interesting bits and from completely different areas of the world as well. So really nice to hear all that. And, and again, I will echo if anyone does have any more questions that we haven't covered today, email them to me. I, I can even manage to put you in touch with some of the panel that we've got here today. They're busy, they're reopening, they've got busy studios, but they might be able to give you uh, a bit of their time. Um, for anyone that we haven't covered the questions, uh, as I've said, please do email them across. For anyone uh, that wants to pick this up and take this on to a next step, please contact myself directly. I'll be sending you an email now with a little bit more information. Uh, for any of you that haven't submitted a, a formal franchise application, you will get that link as well. Um, but yeah, contact me for any questions off the back of this. Uh, again, just want to say thank you very much for the panel today, for everyone that's turned up here. Uh, B, you've done a phenomenal job hosting. It was nice not to hear my own voice for a while. Um, and again, to the team, thank you very much. If you've got anything to add, by all means do. If not, uh, have a lovely afternoon, everyone.